where we are continuing our study through the book of Acts. And last week we talked about being able to rationally explain and reason with people to persuade them, to show them the truth that we already know. To show them that what we believe is actually plausible. Remember Paul sat down and had a conversation with the Jews and the Gentiles in the town of Thessalonica. And it wasn't a preaching environment, it was one of a dialogue, a Q&A, very informal. A time where you get to just talk and have a relationship with the folks and, and be able to minister truth to them. He was able to explain to them in terms that they understood the reality of the gospel. Imagine the situation. Paul probably didn't use terms that they weren't familiar with or wouldn't understand or what we would call today Christianese. How many have ever spoken Christianese? We've all done it, right? These are sayings that we as Christians understand, but most people would not. If I give you an example, we as Christians know the phrase washed in the blood. If you tell that to someone who does not believe, it might sound a little weird. So we, when we talk to someone, we don't want to use terms that they would not understand or examples that would not apply to them. Paul used the Bible and in simple terms showed them the truth. And I said that everyone should be able to do that. You don't have to be a scholar. Just know what Jesus has done for you. And so we saw the results of Paul's time with them in verse 4 of chapter 17. It says, Some who listened were persuaded and became converts, including a large number of godly Greek men and also many important women of the city. First, when we talk to someone, not everyone we talk with is going to respond. How many understand that? The Bible says, Some who listened were persuaded. But it said, Some did. A large number of men and women. You know, the problem is sometimes we equate success with faithfulness. If we're not successful, does it mean we're not faithful? But see, God calls us to be faithful, right? Not, not necessarily successful, or at least successful in our own eyes. Success is God's department. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, God made it grow. So neither he, knew plant, he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who, water, who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. God honors our efforts, not necessarily our results. Make sure that our efforts are correct and we're doing the best that we can, but the results are up to God. We could, you know, Noah was building an ark for 100 years. Nobody got saved in the 100 years that he was there. Not one person other than his family made it into the boat. Was he successful? Yeah. In God's eyes, he did what God called him to do. God also notices our lack of effort. James 4, 17 says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. So he knows what we are doing and he knows what we don't do. How many of you have told your children to go clean up their room and they come out an hour later and it's worse than they went when they went in? <laughs> because as they're cleaning up, they find toys that they want to play with in the process of cleaning up. So you look in the room and they've been there an hour and they feel like they've you know, cleaned up the entire room and it looks worse than when you first started. That's lack of effort. That's kind of diverting yourself from the task. God knows what we do and God knows what we fail to do when we become lazy. Now this particular passage doesn't specifically talk about rewards, but I imagine all of Paul's dealings and preaching and suffering had rewards in the back, if not the front of his mind. First Tim, or 2 Timothy 4, 6, at the end of Paul's life, this is what Paul says. He says, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. It doesn't say successful. 
says faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that great day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but all who eagerly look forward to his glorious return. Most of the things that God talks about as rewards for service are rewards we'll get after this life. There are some we get here, but most of them are talking about after we die and we're with Jesus. God notices everything and records everything. And all that we do in the name of Christ, God's keeping a book. And you will be rewarded according to all that you do. Not all that you're successful at, but all that you do in faith. So now we're going to pick it up where we left off in verse 5 of chapter 17. It says, but the Jewish leaders were jealous, so they gathered some worthless fellows from the streets to form a mob and start a riot. They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out to the crowd. Not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have turned the rest of the world upside down and now they are here disturbing our city, they shouted. And Jason has let them into his home. They are all guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king, Jesus. The people of the city as well as the city officials were thrown into turmoil by these reports. But the officials released Jason and the other believers after they had posted, posted bond. So we see the usual reception by those who don't believe. Rather than just letting them go, not having a big deal about it, they did just the opposite. Do you ever wonder why there's such a negative response to Christianity? You know, it, we're not really making anyone do anything. We're not challenging anyone, but the negative response we get to Christianity seems to be the norm. And if these people could have just let, you know, we agree to disagree, let bygones be bygones, you do what you're going to do, we're going we're to do what we're going to do, but no, they don't. They take it to the extreme. And verse 5 tells us part of why they do that. It says the Jewish leaders were jealous. Jealous of what? Now, wouldn't you think that the Jewish leaders and the people in the town would be happy that some of their friends found something that might better their lives? How often do family members of ours get upset when we start talking about faith, start talking about maybe when we were saved? Not all of our family members understand that. And rather than just letting it go, Sometimes it becomes a conflict. How many have ever had that happen in your life? I remember uh, after I got saved, my parents used to, they would come over and my dad would always start talking about church stuff. And my mother would kick him under the table to help him stop because he was kind of egging me on to a discussion or, or, or maybe kind of an argument. I, I, I didn't understand it. I don't get why that happens. But I think it's, it's more than just surface, surface issues. Remember, we're in a spiritual battle. The enemy is losing ground every time we succeed or every time we are faithful. Don't forget Ephesians 6.12 says, We are fighting against people made of flesh and blood. Not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against those mighty powers of darkness who rule this world and against wicked spirits in the heavenly realms. You know, sometimes as Christians, and especially around here, we tend to downplay the spiritual aspect. We don't focus on the spiritual warfare that's going on around us. But we always need to remember we have an enemy who hates and despises us and wants nothing more than to destroy you. Every time he gets a chance, he's going to want to destroy your life. You know, John 10.10 10 says, he, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I used to think that, well, that's kind of redundant, kill and destroy, but it's not. The enemy can destroy you without killing you. And his whole plan in life, his whole goal is to destroy anything that represents Christ. Obviously, he can't do anything to God, so he's going to do things to God's people. And so the enemy wants any. Nothing more than to get into your life and destroy it. And he does that by using other people. 
There's a constant spiritual battle going on around us, and we have to be aware of that all the time. And if you don't believe that we're in a spiritual battle for the lives of people, what happened in New York last week? You can kill a baby up to the moment he's being born. God help us. I, I can't, it just blows my mind. I can't, I really begin to get ungodly thoughts when I hear about that. Columnist Jerry Newcomb writes this. He says, the thing about abortion is this. The ancient practice of child sacrifice has resumed in earnest with abortion on demand. Only now it's hidden from our eyes. The babies are no longer sacrificed on the altars of the ancient gods of Molech and Baal. Instead, they are sacrificed on the altars of convenience or material benefits. Second Chronicles 33, 6, Manasseh, worst king Judah ever had, and the reason that Judah got invaded, says Manasseh even sacrificed his own sons in the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced sorcery, divination, and witchcraft, and consulted with mediums and psychics. He did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. And this is just me. But I would not be surprised to see God's wrath poured out, either on New York or this country in general. Whenever we turn a blind eye to stuff like that, which is unbelievable to begin with, what do you think God's thinking right now? There is a spiritual battle going on for the lives of babies and people. Next Sunday, we have the human life services. They're coming to, they're the front line against this kind of stuff. We want to encourage them. We want to bless them. Next week, we're gonna, we have little baby bottles that they sent us. It's kind of like a BGMC barrel. And next week, we're going to pass them out, and we're going to ask you to fill those up with change. We're also going to take an offering for them, but we're going to ask you to fill those things up with change and bring them back in about two weeks. And then we're going to send that into them as well. They're on the front lines, and we want to be able to help them help the ladies that come into their clinic. Because the women that are having these abortions, they're struggling. For the most part, they're in a situation they don't want to be in. These folks are helping them to get out of that and more than likely trying to lead them to Christ. So we want to be a part of that. I don't want to take any more thunder away from what they had to say, but I want to say this. Going back to spiritual battle. With all the technology we have today, ultrasounds and, and cameras and everything that's available out there to see the baby in the womb, it is unbelievable to me that people do not see that. And yet they choose to, to kill. That's why I think it's a spiritual battle. Because no, as Christians, we just, it's unbelievable that you can't define that as a baby. I believe the enemy has blinded the minds of people so they can't see that truth. Why else would you do that? I mean, you see all these, how many, these commercials on TV about the dogs that are in cages and stuff, you know, donate $5 a month to help these animals that are so poorly treated. I'm looking at that going, you know, that's great, but they're animals. They're not people. If we give the same amount of care to people that we do to animals, why is that? Because people's minds are blinded. Second Corinthians 4, 4 says the enemy's blinded the minds of unbelievers so they can't see the truth of the gospel. And I believe it's, they can't see the truth of that stuff as well. We are in a spiritual battle for the lives and the souls of people that are in our families, our neighborhoods. That's what we are battling. When it says the Pharisees were jealous, they were losing their power. Everyone in the town was blinded to the truth, and as soon as someone gets saved and the blinders are removed, everyone else thinks they're crazy. All right, I'll put that soapbox away for a while. So, back to being jealous. Why else would they be jealous? Why would the, the leaders of the town be jealous? Well, now you had people who were faithful to the synagogue leaving the synagogue. Many Gentiles, a bunch of prominent women, 
These are probably people who had money and influence. And the Pharisees and the leaders were now losing some of their power, losing some of the folks who were, had influence. They were now leaving the church or the synagogue at that time. And so the leaders were getting upset. And rather than accept the change that was going on, what did they do? Verse 5. It says, So they gathered some worthless fellows from the streets to form a mob and start a riot. Now, we see riots today, right? If you're of a certain age, you, you probably think riots started in, in the 60s with Vietnam. Right? That's what I remember seeing on TV. But in reality, riots have been around forever. The devil is the author of confusion and conflict. So now you can understand why there's rioting. Because the enemy, again, was in charge of what was going on. Again, why such a hostile response? Because it's a spiritual battle. Whenever we stand up for Christ, we can expect a spiritual attack. How many have ever noticed that when you really make a commitment to either read or pray or fast, 8,000 things come up in your life to thwart you from doing that? Or when you're really serving God, something bad happens to stop you from serving God. Because there's an enemy out there who does not want you to succeed in witnessing for Christ. Verse 5 says, They attack the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they can drag him out to the crowd. Why, now, why the riot? These were people who were in charge. Why do they need to make a riot? And why do they drag out these two guys? They couldn't find the other two. Why do they drag out these guys? Because they wanted to get the attention of the crowd. The leaders already had the power. But they only had the power in as much as the people allowed them to have the power. Kind of like our society is supposed to be. So what they did was rather than making a case for themselves, they attracted and they got a, a riot to get the attention of the general populace to get them to see what's going on, to get their attention focused on the rioting. The people they were you know, grabbing, they had no political power, they had no police power. So they had to get to the ones in charge who could do something about it. The riot was formed by people who really had nothing, the Bible calls them worthless fellows. They were those people who had nothing else to do. So, hey, we'll pay you, come out and start a riot. And by the riot, we're going to get everyone else's attention. And so that's what they did. They get these people together, they rioted. And now all of a sudden, the police and all the politicians and all the people who were in charge were seeing this riot. Sound familiar? The people that were causing the riot, if they complained loud enough, had enough noise, maybe we can get the politicians to do something about these guys that we have no power to do. Verse 6. Not finding the, uh, Paul and Silas, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. So we got the riot going on. We got the politicians and the leaders' attention. All kind of cacophony going on. They bring out these two guys. They bring them to the leaders Figuring, okay, we got their attention. They're all upset about the riot. Let's bring them to these folks and get them to do something. They couldn't find the true guys they really wanted. So they grabbed somebody else. Anyone affiliated with Paul and Silas, we'll bring him out and we'll get a voice before the authorities. We'll bring this guy out and he'll be our example. So what they were doing is they were trying to put punishment on Jason for nothing that he actually did other than house Paul and Silas. He was trying to, they were trying to get to Paul and Silas through Jason. And I was, I was writing this down, I thought about where else did this happen? Where else did people house other people on the run because they didn't want those folks to get harmed? I'm thinking Germany, World War II. How many people housed Jews to prevent them from being caught. And what happened when they found them out? The people who did the housing suffered the same punishment as the Jews would have suffered. So Jason was facing the same type of punishment 
as Paul and Silas would have had, had these officials or had these Jewish leaders got their way. Sometimes even being behind the scenes, just being associated with Christ might result in hardship your way. How many understand that? Verse 6 and 7, Paul and Silas have turned the rest of the world upside down and now they're heading here to dis disturbing our city. They shouted, and Jason has let them into his home. They are all guilty of treason against Caesar for they profess allegiance to another king, Jesus. Notice that all these accusations were lies. None of them were true. Nothing that they have done to this point would have been treasonous against Caesar. They did not tell them to overthrow the law. They didn't tell them to disobey the, the commander. They didn't tell them anything. But they were using these lies again to gin up charges against these two. Does this tactic and accusation sound familiar to you? Kind of the same thing they said to Jesus, right? Luke 23. It says, The entire council took Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor. They began at once to state their case. This man has been leading our people to ruin by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government and by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. Now, not paying taxes would be considered treasonous. Jesus never told them, told them not to pay taxes. In fact, he said, go get the money out of the fish to pay the taxes. So he never did any of that stuff. And because they said he's going to be claiming a king, they were threatening Pilate and the government. The arguments and the complaints against believers don't really change over the years because the enemy is very predictable. The leaders in Thessalonica would have been aware of the problems that happened in Rome in Jesus' time. They, they knew about the riots and all the stuff that happened with Jesus. And they were afraid of having that same thing happen in their town. And the mob was trying to play to that fear. Hey, remember what happened in Jesus in Rome a few years ago? Do you really want that here? Let's get rid of these guys now to prevent that riot from happening. In reality, it wasn't the Christians who were rioting. It was the others rioting against the Christians. And what was happening, the crowd was again trying to miscategorize what was happening by blaming the Christians. How many have heard the narrative that the Inquisition was run by Christians. How many know it's not a true narrative? How many know that it was the Christians who were Christians in name only were actually persecuting the true Christians? That was the Inquisition. It was run by non-believers under a, quote, church, punishing and torturing people who were true believers. That was the true Inquisition. It wasn't Christians persecuting other people. And so what you're getting here is people miscategorizing what actually Christians do versus what the non-believer does. Verse 8 says, The people of the city as well as the city officials were thrown into turmoil by these reports. Now, why was that? Well, leaders don't want rioting. They don't want anything happening in their town. But apparently there was not enough evidence against Jason to do anything about it. They could have brought him up on charges, but there was nothing that they... He did that was wrong in their eyes. But instead of standing up and doing the right thing, now he was free, he should have let him go, no problem. But kind of kowtowing to the crowd, he couldn't punish him because that was, you know, not right. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to try and persuade him to not do it again. Leaders should do the right thing not just please the crowd to in order to avert any kind of grief that might come their way. And I think in today's politics, everyone's listening to the crowd and no one's doing the right thing. So now these leaders were kind of between a rock and a hard place. We don't want the rioting. We can't throw them in jail because they didn't do anything. Can't we just get rid of the crowd? Here's how we're going to do it. Verse 9 says, but the officials released Jason and the other believers after they posted bail. Now, the bail isn't what we consider bail today. The bail was actually a bond that assured the town leaders that Paul wasn't going to come back. 
Jason said, I'll, I'll, I'm going to find you this money. If they come back, A, you're going to lose the money, and B, we're going to put you in jail. It's basically Jason promising them that Paul and Silas wasn't going to go back and do it again to kind of end any kind of conflict that was going on. Kind of like probation. Paul brings this same thing back up in his letter to the church in Thessalonica. After he leaves, a couple of months pass, he writes a letter back to them in 1 Thessalonians 2. He says in verse 17, Dear brothers and sisters, after we were separated from you for a little while, afterwards they left town with Jason in the house, though our hearts never left you, we tried very hard to come back because our intense longing to see you again. We wanted very much to come, and I, Paul, tried again and again, but Satan prevented us. Paul's hands were tied because of the bond or the bail that Jason had to post. If Paul went back, not only would Paul be persecuted, but now Jason would also be in trouble. So Paul could not go back. But in spite of the hardship that would follow in that town, the hardship in Thessalonica, and the hardship that Paul suffered in Thessalonica, he rejoiced that the church in that town was still growing. 1 Thessalonians 3, 6. Writing back to them about how, what he hears is going on. He says, Now Timothy has just returned, bringing the good news that your faith and love are as strong as ever. He reports that you remember our visit with joy and that you want to see us just as much as we want to see you. So we have been greatly comforted, dear brothers and sisters, in all of our crushing troubles and suffering because you have remained strong in your faith. It gives us new life knowing you remain strong in the Lord. You know, I've said this before. The, strong, the church is the strongest where persecution is the toughest. How many know that's true? Historically, it's true. When things go easy and soft, the church gets soft. When there's hardship and persecution, the church bands together and it gets stronger. You look at the church in, in countries where they're prohibited, China, Soviet Union, all those communist, socialist countries where religion is outlawed. The church is strong. It may not be visible, but it's strong. In America, where the church is very visible, it's not as strong. We don't take the persecution and hardship as we should. But Paul is saying, and it, it, this is for me, I think this is true. The more that I see someone's faith growing, the easier it is for me to have hardship. I'll, I'll give you an example. How many of you pray for your children or your family and you pray that they be saved and if that means something happens to me, I'm okay with that. You pray that? Parents probably pray that a lot. If it takes my death or my suffering for my kids to know Christ, I am totally good with that. How many agree with that? Why? And how many have ever prayed whatever it takes? Whatever it takes. Because usually it's hardship and suffering that gets people's attention so they need Christ. And if things are going great and your life's humming along, you don't really need Jesus, right? But if things go south and things are getting hard, most people realize they need help beyond themselves. And that's where, Lord, whatever it takes, if it takes that hardship to get their attention so they're able to listen to the truth. I don't know how many people I've visited in the hospitals that you get to talk to them about that because they're facing bad things. Funerals, a great time to talk about Jesus because people get to see their own mortality. People that they love have, are now died. Who knows what's next? How many saw that wreck the other day where that tractor trailer pushed that car under the SUV? I could barely see the car. That's actually a guy that Anna works with over in Hanover that was in that car and he's in a hospital not doing great. You never know. I believe that as we see people's lives changed by Christ, 
The hardships we face in ministry will take a backseat to the joy we have that God used us to save other people. Paul saying, hey, the suffering that I had in Thessalonica, all the crap I took there, I am totally good with that because I see the church growing. If that's what it takes for someone to grow, I'm okay with that. Because I know that my life, as Paul said in Timothy, my life was poured out as an offering. My life has been poured into someone else's life so that their faith is strong, their life is now on target with Christ, and if it took me suffering a little bit, okay, God's going to remember that. I'm okay with that. And that's where Paul is leaving them off now. When he wrote the letter to them, he's encouraging them and saying, you know what, even though we suffered, I'm just happy to see your life. I'm happy to see that you are remaining strong. Verse 7, you have remained strong in your faith. And it gives Paul new life knowing that you remain strong. The end result of someone's salvation will make the work that we put into it worthwhile. How many agree with that? Would you stand as we close this morning? Every head bowed, every eye closed, if you would. You know, it'd probably be a lot easier for all of us if we just slept in on Sunday and stayed home on Wednesday. Our life would be easier. We would have less responsibility, less things to do. But each of us have chosen to give up those things in order to be used by God for whatever He wants us to do. We come to church on Sunday morning to fellowship and to be blessed by God, to hear God's word and then be energized to go out and be used to be poured out as an offering during the week. And then we come back on Sunday and get filled up again and go out and do it again. Those of us involved in in ministry, whether it's teaching or even from nursery up through preaching, everyone, every ministry department, kids, youth, nursery, whatever it might be, everyone is a, is a cog in the machine that God uses to reach people and bless people and grow people. And all the work that we put into it makes it worthwhile. I look back and I see some of the kids that I had in seventh grade Sunday school class. Now they're in ministry. Now they're pastors of churches. Now they're business people serving Christ. And I realized that what little effect I had on them in that class hopefully helped them to be who they are today. And so the work I put into that, man, was really worthwhile. All the work we put into something for Christ does not return empty. God will use you And God will allow people's lives to be blessed by us. You may not see it right now. You may not see it in years from now. When I was teaching those seventh graders, I thought, they're going to end up in jail. But God used that to transform them. And it mattered to them that they were in that class. It matters to the students we teach that they're in your class, that they're in this church. It matters not only for today, but more importantly, it matters for eternity. Paul looked back on Thessalonica when, after he left, and he realized that all his effort he put into that town was worth it. You may feel discouraged in what you're doing. They don't listen. Kids misbehave. It's a thankless job. But God's the one keeping track. And just like Paul, God's got a reward stored up for you. Not only in heaven, but as you see the fruits of your effort in your students as they grow and mature in Christ, I'm telling you, it's a blessing to you. 
Maybe you're here this morning and you've never really committed your life to Christ. You, you've been in church for a while. Maybe this is your first time or you've been here for a long time. But you've never really made that commitment. You know about Jesus, but you don't know him personally. You're here today not by accident, not by coincidence. You're here because God wanted you to be here to hear something or see something or experience something for God to get your attention. If you've never committed your life to Christ, you've never asked, you've never truly asked to have your sins forgiven, washed clean, and God give you a brand new slate. But you want to do that today. I want you to raise your hand right now. All right, I'm going to believe most of us or all of us are committed followers of Christ. I want to encourage you that all the work that you do, and even in the workforce, if you go to a job every day, that's a ministry. That's a place that God can use you. And all the effort and the time you put into that job is also going to be rewarded because you are faithful in what God has called you to do. And the Bible tells us that we're not to up and leave everything that we have the moment we get saved. We're supposed to stay where we are and make a difference where we are. And as you make that difference, again, you'll see how God uses you and you'll see that there's a benefit to you being where you are and that God will reward that as well. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for saving us. Thank you for calling us to where we are. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of what you're doing. And Lord, thank you for allowing us to receive joy and comfort and excitement as we see things that we do in your name actually work and change people's lives. That what we do in whatever economy you place us works because you are doing it through us. Lord, I pray your blessings upon each person here today as we leave. Help us to be energized or re-energized as we leave this building that God, everywhere we go is a ministry, is a mission field and that you have equipped us to make a difference where we are. And then as we see that difference, Lord, we want to honor you and thank you for allowing us to do that in your name. So, Father, keep us safe as we travel. Bring us back again on Wednesday to re-energize, to refill, and to be reused by you for your kingdom, honor, and glory. And we will thank you, Lord, for being faithful to us in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We will see you Wednesday.